I was always at the border between life and death in my childhood. When I had to endure something very horrific the first time, knowing that no one else was around there to help me, there was this inner scream, Dear God, please help me. And then suddenly I was rapidly going through a tunnel towards a light which was increasing in brightness. And right before I had the feeling that I couldn't bear the brightness any longer, I would usually find myself on a beautiful meadow with blooming flowers. And by my side there was a shepherd with snow-white sheep. Frau Dauster, wir sind einander hier bei Ihnen vor ein paar Jahren schon einmal gegenüber gesessen. Miss Dauster, a few years ago we were sitting together right here in your living room. You told us about a near-death experience that you had had a few years prior. And you mentioned briefly that you had already had an out-of-body experience as a child, during a childhood that you described as horrible without going into detail. beschrieben haben, ohne dabei in Details zu gehen. Nun ist von Ihnen ein Buch erschienen, es trägt den Titel Now you have written a book with the title Victim Child. I have survived hell because I have always believed in heaven. This title already implies that you have had to go through exceptionally bad times. What was your childhood like in summary? Worum ging es in Ihrer Kindheit zusammenfassend? Kurz zusammengefasst ging es in meiner Kindheit in short summary, my childhood was all about my father being violent towards me, increasing the violence on a continuous basis and inflicting tremendous pain onto me with the intention that I would become suicidal to the degree that I would eventually kill myself. Aus dem Leben scheiden will, also dass ich nicht mehr leben will und mich mich selbst töte. My father was, as I know now, very ill. He was a psychopath. The meaning of my suicide would have actually provided the proof for him that it isn't God who is the highest or the mightiest, but the power that he believed in. Basically, if a human being commits suicide, then this is the evidence that the dark side is stronger than God. And therefore, I had to endure many things in my childhood. I have survived it every time. Because at one point in my childhood, I have been allowed to experience the other side, which always helped me with no ifs and buts. Basically, these were near-death experiences that I had as a child, even though I couldn't really tell what those experiences were back then. The other side was an experience of light? Yes, it was a... Yes, I was always at the border between life and death in my childhood. When I had to endure something very horrific the first time, knowing that no one else was around there to help me, there was this inner scream, Dear God, please help me. And then suddenly I was rapidly going through a tunnel towards a light which was increasing in brightness. And right before I had the feeling that I couldn't bear the brightness any longer, I would usually find myself on a beautiful meadow with blooming flowers. And by my side there was a shepherd with snow-white sheep. We don't have to go into detail. You have described many scenes in your book. 
It's about sexual abuse and about excessive violence, always expecting a tremendous amount of pain, even death. Is that correct? Ist das gut zusammengefasst? Das ist so gut zusammengefasst, ja, weil diese ähm, Yes, that is a correct summary. These actions weren't only exercised by my father, there were other people involved in this lodge as well. Loge damals auch mehrere andere Menschen organisiert. Diese Untaten oder Taten, das, was man mir angetan hat, But whatever they did to me, they made sure that even if there were people who could have potentially helped me, they still wouldn't be able to do so because they couldn't even be there in the first place. They were choosing locations where normal people wouldn't be around. Einfach sich nicht aufgehalten hätte. This lodge, how you call it, would nowadays be defined as Satanism. Yes, some people who lived in the town of my childhood were organized in this Satanism lodge or Satanic group. Satanismus lodge or Satanismus group auch organisiert. What role did your father play in this lodge? Er war der Kopf dieser Loge. He was the head of this lodge. There were many members in this organization, and it went from bottom to top or from top to bottom. All kinds of occupational groups were organized in this lodge. There were physicians, lawyers, police officers, as well as simple people. This lodge was perfectly organized, with ever-changing duties that everyone needed to perform from time to time. Everyone knew when he had to do certain things. All the people involved could have been definitely possible targets of blackmail and therefore leaving the lodge was more or less impossible. According to the descriptions of your injuries in your book, they were so severe that nobody could possibly survive such situations without medical treatment. Were all those people who helped you with medical treatments also a member of that lodge? Physicians were also organized in this lodge, but mostly it was a man, a physician, who was in contact with my father, but in some other way, who helped me over and over again. But you had never received help from someone who would have given you shelter and safety. I had my shepherd. Ever since I met him during my very first near-death experience, I knew that no matter what happens to me here on earth, even if no one will be there to help me, I have a friend who will always help me. Wenn kein Mensch da ist, der mir helfen kann, ich habe einen Freund, der wird mir immer helfen. This profound knowledge was something I was always carrying with me. Therefore, I didn't really miss anyone on earth, because I knew that I will repeatedly be exposed to certain situations where no one else could possibly help me anyways. Can you actually recall the first time that you had encountered the shepherd? Was hat sich dazu getragen? Die allererste Situation, ja, die bestand darin, dass... Ähm, yes, well, mich, ja, my father had also sold me to pedophiles. Whenever um, we returned back home, he always demanded that I would clean myself. The substance he provided for me to do that with caused a lot of pain. 
And that day I went to the bathroom, but then I thought, I don't want this pain right now. I didn't follow his instruction. And he noticed that, and he knew that I had been disobedient. And he told me that he wants to do that cleansing procedure instead of me. He had vinegar essence, which he used to call the holy water of the devil. And he basically made some sort of chemical solution with that. But I haven't experienced any pain in this moment, because in that instant I was already gone. I quickly looked down at myself and I noticed that my father reacted with panic because I went unconscious. And then I, my soul, left rapidly through a tunnel extremely fast. It was a light tunnel, always further and further into the light. And when I opened my eyes, I was laying on a green meadow with wonderful, beautiful blooming flowers all around me. And besides me, there was a shepherd sitting next to me who was looking at me with his kind and loving brown eyes. I noticed that his herd consisted of snow-white sheep. In this moment, I didn't know where I came from. I just felt infinitely well. And then I asked him, who are you? And he answered, I am the one you were calling for. I want to go back to the situation on earth quickly. When my father was actually using this chemical solution on my body, I was just screaming internally, Dear God, help me. And followed by that, I was stepping out of my body, looking down at my body and eventually me asking the shepherd who he was and him answering me that he was the one I had been calling for. But in this very moment, I couldn't remember that I have called for anybody, let alone who. Everything was out of time and space, and without any memory regarding the situation on earth. And when he added, and I have all the names that you will ever give me, I thought, all the names that I will give you? No. I have to find only one name for you by which I can call you again and again because here I am feeling infinitely great. And since a lot of male names from the earthly realms were already associated with bad deeds, I simply came up with Joseph. Nobody I knew was called like that. Therefore, I said to myself, I have to give you one name that will bring you to me every time. So Joseph, the shepherd, will never let me down. That was the very first encounter with him. Joseph, the shepherd, he lässt mich nie im Stich. How old were you at that point? I guess I must have been between six and seven years old. Did this cry for God happen spontaneously, or had you experienced a religious Christian upbringing? No, I was brought up in a Catholic environment. Within my family, like my grandmother or other relatives, those beliefs of God have been embraced to us children. They told us about God and about angels, and therefore I was kind of aware as a child about the existence of God and angels. 
I had already seen my guardian angel before that incident too. But all of this was abstract. And even after that first encounter, I still had no idea who I had met. As a child, usually one is not able to grasp something like that. I would like to go into that a little bit further, but first, another question is rather imminent. How did your mother and grandmother react to all that? Was he really able to disguise all of that? Yes, he could disguise everything, and I have to say he was definitely ill. He was a psychopath, and the one thing that he was perfect at was acting, to pretend to be someone else. And indeed, he sometimes was a loving and kind father. But then there was this other side of him where I knew something terrible is going to happen to me again. My mother was not aware of it for a long time, what he was actually doing the whole time. And as soon as she knew what was really going on, she had tried to do something about it. My father was actually put into a mental hospital a couple of times, but his treatments were never successful. He was never healed from his illness. He was just starting to use more perfidious tragedies and got even more cautious. At the end of the day, my mother wasn't able to protect my life either. He was playing everybody off against each other. These out-of-body experiences, this immaterial world, became your shelter. Did you have regular encounters with the shepherd? Was there some continuity? I don't think they were regular encounters. They generally happened only then, when my life was threatened immensely. When my body was literally between life and death, I was able to flee to my shepherd, or I was taken there by my guardian angels. Generally speaking, in order to experience these encounters, something cruel had to happen to me in the physical realm, which obviously I couldn't understand as a child. I couldn't understand how people could behave like that and why they were doing all these things. I addressed this question to the shepherd. I have asked him all those questions that were important to me in certain situations, and he answered all of them. I would say that he gave me answers step by step, so that I, as a child, was able to comprehend them. And after the understanding has occurred, I was fine again. I was able to understand, but at the same time I was surrounded by that beautiful light, by that kindness and love, which was also giving me a lot of strength back. And then I was back in my body again. I can't exactly recall how many times it had happened. In my book, I have included so many many conversations that I had with him, even very long ones. In retrospect, I believe that I have not received the full answer in one single encounter. Maybe multiple encounters were necessary for that. Therefore, I am not sure. Reading what injuries you had been forced to endure, these encounters must have been not only about explanations, but about healing. You have experienced a number of recoveries that anyone would call inexplicable, that anyone would call miracle healings. Yeah, I see this as ganz genauso. That's exactly how I view it. 
because this light or being in this light that I call universal, unconditional love, without any ifs and buts, it was not just a feeling from the outside. As a matter of fact, the light was flooding through the body. Every single body cell was flooded with this light. I would also say it's healing. It's a healing light. Being in this light is healing, not only for the soul, but for the body, mind and soul. I can't explain it in any other way. Looking at the further course of my life, I can certainly say that this was all intentional or it was all guided by the divine instance, as if it was wanted by our Creator that I was supposed to survive all of the severe abuse. Diese schwersten Misshandlungen auch immer wieder überlebe. Wann sind Ihre when did your diary entries occur that were used to describe your encounters with the shepherds? These were not really diary entries. This terrible childhood, on the other hand, what has been done to me, and on the other hand, the reason for my surviving, this childlike martyrdom had ended with the death of my father, followed by a conscious suppression process, otherwise I wouldn't have survived. So I forgot this terrible childhood. It was gone. Ich habe also diese schreckliche Kindheit vergessen. Sie war weg. When it ended, how old were you at the time? I was 13. And for the next 30 years, I haven't known anything about my childhood anymore. As if it was completely vanished. A few years later, I also moved to another federal state, so I never had any possible confrontations with people who would have maybe asked me something about my childhood. I was a stranger, and nobody wanted to know anything about me, kind of as an even further protection for the subconscious mind. You even wrote that you forgetting everything was also important for all the other people involved. Yes, of course, that was very important for these people, because I knew a lot about the things they had done. These people involved were actually panicking after the death of my father. They were afraid that I would press charges against them. Once again, the forgetting served as a protection. A protection against those people that had tried to kill me several times before. And around 30 years after that process of forgetting, I started to remember my childhood again. In the course of almost two years. And the extraordinary thing about it is that I was able to recall whole conversations word for word. The ones amongst the perpetrators, as well as everything that had been said in those conversations which I had with my shepherd during my childhood. Everything came back to my memory, word for word. And the process of remembering was very painful, since I had to relive everything. But... I was allowed to relive all those encounters with my shepherd again, and I was also allowed to experience the light again, to feel it. On the one hand, there was all the pain, obviously. It was all pouring out of the subconscious mind. Whenever that happened, there were no people around me to whom I could have explained it all, and therefore I wrote it all down. I wrote it all down in the exact way how my inner child remembered everything that had happened at the time. 
das und das ist mir passiert. How old were you exactly when those memories came back? Let me think. That was from 1996 to 1998. I was 43 years old. Is it correct to assume that there were no memories at all when you were thinking of your childhood? It was nothing there. I wasn't even aware of it. That might sound strange, but I had some memories around the time before I moved away from our village. But all those memories were the ones that took place after my memory loss. These were either memories about me being a member of the local choir, or a member of the Maltese aid service, or Memories of the time when I had started working, those were my only memories. I was not aware that I couldn't remember anything else about my childhood before that. It wasn't an issue, but I actually didn't mind that at all. How did this replacement process occur? I don't think it's possible to forget all those years of your childhood all at once. That was a very conscious process with the help of my mother, with the help of the parish nurse, and with the help of this physician, who had already patched me up a couple of times during my childhood. He was also a psychiatrist. With the support of all these people and my own free will, I was able to forget everything. Habe ich es geschafft, das alles zu vergessen? It was very, very hard work at the time. I, as a child, knew back then that I can only go on living if I forgot everything. And if I wouldn't be able to forget it all, then I wouldn't want to stay alive any longer, since it was a constant nightmare. It was over, but at the same time it wasn't over. The chain of events was constantly rewinding inside of me. Therefore, I managed to imagine a chest of drawers in the center of my body with seven different drawers. And each one of my smaller inner children were allowed to store each of their own collected memories away. So you had help with that? Yes, that is right. I had help with that. Eventually, the full suppression occurred towards the end of that time when I was in coma for three days. In my childish naivety, I made up a plan. I was collecting some psychotropic drugs that were prescribed to me early on during that suppression process. Damit ich nachts schlafen konnte. They were supposed to ease my problems with insomnia, but they also made me tired during the day. These psychotropic drugs were only prescribed in a very low dosage. In my childish naivety, I had decided that if I would store the prescribed dosage three times, then take it all at once, it could be possible that I could forget everything. Das dann plötzlich alles vergessen ist. Das ist kindliche Denkweise, ne? Kann man Childlike way of thinking, kind of understandable. Eventually, that was exactly what I did, and it turned out to be an overdose at that time. I was between life and death again, and while I had been in a coma for three days. I was allowed to be with my shepherd for one last time. I was actually allowed to make the decision whether I wanted to stay there or if I wanted to go back. That turned out to be a very long conversation where he had explained to me that if I went back, I would lose memory of everything. But he also told me that after a certain amount of time, which he cannot name, I will be able to retrieve all those memories again. I would have people by my side who would be chosen by him and who would accompany me on my way. 
because it won't be an easy way to go. And there was not only that snow white sheep herd. Every now and then during my flights to the shepherd, I was able to see another herd of sheep. They were spotted sheep without a shepherd and somewhere in a really miserable state. In one of my first encounters with my shepherd, I have asked him about them and he explained to me that those sheep were the souls of those people who still need forgiveness. Forgiveness from people down on earth too. And I wanted this sheep herd to be able to join him as well. I wanted to help those sheep by finding the people on earth who need to forgive them. So there actually was a whole range of reasons why, during our last encounter, I came to the conclusion that I don't want to stay here yet. I want as many souls as possible to join you. I will go back again. Ever since that happened, I had actually forgotten everything. I didn't remember anything from my childhood anymore. Decades later, those memories came back again. How did this happen? What exactly was the trigger for that? That was about half a year after the death of my mother. In fall, actually no, around All Saints Day. I was back in my hometown and I was sitting in a room at my parents' house, which had been built afterwards as an extension to the house. Das mittlerweile, das war ein Anbau. Also, und konnte von diesem Anbau. From there, I was able to look into a room of the actual old building that used to be the bedroom of my parents. hineinsehen, wo früher das Elternschlafzimmer war. Und ich habe in dieses Zimmer einfach hineingeschaut. I was looking into that room. And all of a sudden, I was feeling very bad. And it got worse and worse. I can't describe that feeling. It was like creeping up inside me. It was fear. I was very uncomfortable. And it actually increased up to sheer panic. Just by seeing that room that dark room. And I was able to get help back then. But when my brother asked me what was going on with me, I simply couldn't answer anything else but that I didn't know, I'm just afraid. And after I had returned home to my own safe place, I was being shown a picture two weeks later in front of my inner eye. I saw myself as a child in that very room on my parents' bed, together with my father. I couldn't get rid of that picture. I couldn't push it away. It was simply existing. At first I was unable to talk about it, but I was able to tell my therapist at some point. Then, that door to my subconscious mind was closed again. That steel door? Exactly, that steel door. In retrospect, I can tell that seeing that first glimpse of entrance into my subconscious mind was pretty harmless compared to what was about to follow. Obviously, I didn't know what was still to come. But after seeing this picture, I felt good at one point. And I thought, that's it. You had been abused as a child and therefore you weren't able to be happy for many years of your life, not as happy as one could have imagined it for oneself. And after this first insight, I felt really good, very good. Well, and then that door opened up all of a sudden and even more and more images came in. And every time, re-experiencing basically felt just as real as being in that situation all over again. I had to endure that pain that was attached to those memories all over again. Sometimes the pain came first and two days later the picture showed up which explained the pain. 
einen Tag vorher, dass ich nur Schmerzen hatte und dann kam zwei And then I wrote everything down again. And as soon as I was finished, the pain was gone. And you were under constant therapeutic supervision? Yes, I was. But I would have needed a therapist day and night. You have reconstructed your own childhood with the help of the recollections of your own memories. And that could be doubted, at least partially. Have you ever received proof for anything, maybe for injuries that would actually prove that any of it had really happened? First of all, after these memories had come back, I was finally able to explain so many different things. For instance, why did my body react extremely allergic to antibiotics, to penicillin, when I had taken it once as a grown-up? Then I had the explanation for that, because I had suffered from so many injuries as a child, and at that time only penicillin was prescribed against that. Or, for instance, I had received a booster vaccine against tetanus after 40 years or so after my childhood. And I suffered a shock after that vaccination with very high fever and so on. Afterwards, the titer determination showed that it was so extremely high that it was enough for the rest of my life. The explanation for this was that back in the days it was the standard procedure for these severe injuries to inject a vaccine against tetanus just to be safe. So during these years of forgetting, my body had been reacting strangely every now and then already. But I just thought, oh, I must be very sensitive. Just sometimes, when I had medical checkups, like, for instance, when I had to do dental x-rays, and the dentist told me, oh, Your jaw was broken once. And I was like, well, I would know if that was the case. That was at the time when my memories were still suppressed, where he simply said, you have had a fracture of the jaw, or your nose had been broken once. Or when I had problems with headaches, I had to go to a checkup where the coordination of my hands was tested as well. And the orthopedist said, you are not able to move that hand to such an extent, looks like you had your hand broken at some point as well. And every time I was sitting there asking myself what these people were talking about, I would know if something like that had happened to me. Those were hints that were swallowed up by my subconscious mind at the time. I was not thinking about it. And after the regression work, all of those situations became crystal clear. All of these broken bones and injuries that were revealed coincidentally during checkups, but left me clueless at the time. And in your book, you also describe those scenes that had led to those fractures and injuries. Yes, for instance, I had wrinkles for a long time, a very long time. In retrospect, all those wrinkles on my forehead are actually very small scars, nearly invisible scars that exist due to the injuries that were inflicted upon me in my childhood. My subconscious mind had to take all those scars into the depth as well. All that was left were wrinkles or skin changes, so that neither I nor anyone else would have asked me Where does that scar come from? And that I consider truly fascinating when it comes to forgetting everything. I forgot everything. Even my body had simply forgotten everything. 
After all those memories had come back, how did you deal with the topic of forgiveness? Were you able to forgive your father and all those people involved just like that? I have already forgiven my father in his last hour back then as a child. Because he was not only that cruel person, he was also a loving father. As a child, I had actually found a way to separate that. That's my father who loves me, who can be very good to me, and whenever he changed into that other person, at least that's how I had perceived it as a child, that wasn't my father anymore. My father was seriously ill before, and he had to suffer enormously. Shortly before he passed away, he had done something very bad once again. And on the last evening before he died, I somehow sensed that within me that he would die. I wanted to go near him because he looked at me. He was laying on the couch and I was standing in the doorway with the door half open. But my feet just didn't move. They wouldn't walk. And I remember thinking that if I come close to him, he might turn into that other person again that hurts me. So I was simply looking at him through that door. He had no hatred, nothing in his eyes. Instead, he gave me a very strange look. And deep from within me, without even thinking, I've sent him this thought, I forgive you. And then I went to bed and decided to pray. I prayed to God to please let him die. I was thinking all of us would have our peace finally. But then I started to doubt myself, and I was wondering if I was even allowed to ask for his death. Am I not supposed to pray for his life? And then I prayed the other way around. But I realized that even though I pray to God for his life, I am thinking that God should let him die. And then I was crying about myself. And then I said to God, I cannot pray, because I can't pray genuinely. That is not an honest prayer, please. It's up to you. Then I was able to fall asleep, and he actually died during that night. So I have actually forgiven him in his death hour. I forgave him as a child already. And I am sure, if I had not been able to do that there and then, it wasn't even an intention of mine, it simply came from within. I forgive you. My life would have turned out differently. Have you ever encountered someone who had also been a member of that lodge after your memories had come back? Ich habe diese Menschen nach diesem Erinnerungsprozess uh, After that process of recovering my memories again, I have met some of those people every now and then when I was visiting my hometown. But I have encountered them without any anger, rage or hate, because I had forgiven these people a long time ago as well. And sometimes no one of them was visible. And in one situation, I was standing across from a previous perpetrator and we were just looking at each other. And I didn't say anything. But he reacted in a totally weird manner. 
Afterwards, he asked himself, what on earth was that? I interpret it like that. His subconscious mind, which had to suppress his previous life chapter as well, has reacted to my subconscious and basically an inner knowing told him, both of you are standing in front of each other. She knows everything. But I think he wasn't aware of that in his conscious mind. You are convinced that these memories had been so bad for the perpetrators as well, so that they also had to flee into a replacement process. Yes, I am, definitely. Because that lodge was organized perfectly. Everyone knew everything that someone else had done. And occasionally, there were people who wanted to leave over the years. Sometimes, inexplicable deaths had occurred. Why did these people suddenly lose their lives? There were no investigations, because the members were also policemen public prosecutors, judges or physicians. All of it was swept under the carpet. But I also think that these people had conscience. After the leader of that organization was dead, and they had no structure and no leadership left over the years, a possibility was created for the conscience to rise to the surface again. And I'm sure that some of those people have actually suffered because of what they had done previously. And some of them might have to suppress certain memories in order to cope with it. Do you think there exists others, women and children, that also had to endure similar things? Do you know of such people? I don't believe it, I know it. In my book, I haven't described everything. A lot of what I was able to remember isn't mentioned. If one considers that my memories filled 3,500 handwritten pages in A4 format and then compares that with the book, one realizes that by far not everything has been described there. Which was a conscious decision, though, regarding my own memories that involved other people. But there were lots of people, mostly women and children, who were tortured immensely as well. Die also schon auch sehr gequält wurden. Are you in contact with other people who have also been victims? Would you wish to get in touch with such people? Do you hope that you could succeed in starting something in them as well, something like an inner process of forgiveness? Over the years, due to my cooperation with the network for near-death experiences called Netzwerk Nahtoderfahrung, I keep getting in touch with people who have had near-death experiences. Especially during the last two years, I was often invited to talks or conventions, and afterwards people would increasingly reach out to me or to the organizer of that event, for instance, a pastor. Oder auch Kontakt zum jeweiligen Veranstalter, zum Beispiel zum Pfarrer der Pfarrer. Sometimes it is their first time to open up and speak about the fact that they had a similar path, which contained pain and violence in that sense. Schmerzen und Gewalt angetan wurde. In our last conversation, you have reported that you had a recent near-death experience. Was that a reunion with your shepherd? How did that go on? Wie hat sich das weiter abgespielt? Ich hatte dann ja 2011. I had a near-death experience in 2011 after a cardiac arrest and a very long reanimation process, which lasted 27 minutes. Weitere Nahtoderfahrung. Und es war 
And this time, it was very different compared to the near-death experiences I had during my childhood. I wasn't going very fast through a tunnel and I was not arriving in a beautiful meadow with a shepherd. Instead, I left this earthly situation. I was able to look down at myself from above. While my body was repeatedly shocked with that defibrillator, I was actually not able to bear looking at my body in that situation, that whole scenario with the rescue team and the emergency doctor. And auch die dieses ganze Szenario mit den mit den Sanitätern, mit dem Notarzt. I was leaving the scene very slowly. I went to some waters where I was crying into. And then I moved on to the top of a high mountain. And I was directing my request to the higher realms. Please help me. I don't know what to do. And then heaven or infinity opened up. And I felt that light, this unconditional love again, as if it flooded down on me and through me. And it was identical to the feeling that I had experienced in my childhood. I haven't seen a shepherd, but I have heard his voice though. To my pleading, please help me, I don't know what to do, he answered, you know very well what you have to do. You must go back. During my childhood, I have received a very long explanation how the soul works, how it stays attached to the body and that the body needs the soul, especially during the process of death. He had already explained all that to me in my childhood. Therefore, he simply answered, you do know what to do, you have to return. But I thought, no, this time I don't want to go back. And I went up even higher. And so I found myself in an even further state of this unconditional love, wrapped in colors. And at one point, it arose within me. Yes, I have to go back once again. The body needs the soul. Because the body was laying in between these worlds. But I didn't know what I was coming back for, either to live or to die. There were those two options. But either way, I had to go back. Thirteen days later, I woke up on the intensive care unit. And being in this love that absolutely can't be described with words, in this light, was absolutely the same feeling in 2011, as well as during the experiences in my childhood. And in retrospect, I can say that without the presence of the shepherd by my side, who I was actually able to see, I wouldn't have been able to understand my near-death experiences as a child. I wouldn't have been able to understand anything. And so our Creator has shown Himself to me as a shepherd in my childhood. In meiner Kindheit sich mir einfach als Schäfer gezeigt. Eine Frage, die Sie sich A question that must have accompanied you all those years is, why do I have to go through all of this? What answer have you got today, after all of your experiences and insights? I received this answer as well. In autumn in 2011, about six months after my cardiac arrest, from this loving voice of my shepherd. I need to mention that after this incident, my body was pretty wrecked and the recovery process took a very long time. Nothing has been the same anymore. So at the end of fall in 2011, I was not feeling good at all. 
And a certain thought crawled up into my mind, even though I didn't want to think it, it just popped up. What is left for me here? I myself was pretty shocked about such a thought and even felt some shame that it occurred in my own head because no one has the right to kill himself or other people. But then this voice gave me the following answer to this thought. You shall give testimony. I remember being still for a moment and I eventually said, good, I will gladly do that, but please help me, show me how, when and what. And now, in retrospect, I can say that it is my task to testify. Amongst other things, how I was allowed to survive this childhood against all odds. And one important testimony is your book, Victim Child. It was published in spring of 2020, and the co-author of it is Dr. Walter Miley, a Swiss psychiatrist. He has explained everything that had happened to you from a psychological point of view. How did this collaboration come about? You know, I believe in the quote from Albert Schweitzer when he said, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. I met Dr. Walter Miley in July 2017 at a conference of the Network for Near-Death Experiences in Bühl. I could take part at the conference only since 2017 because I had only retired just the year before. The first weekend in July would have not been available for a conference if I continued working for another year, because that time of the year was always connected with a big youth welfare that had to be organized. But since I had retired in August 2016, I was able to drive to Bühl in order to attend that conference in July 2017. There, I had a conversation with an evangelic pastor about my near-death experiences and my encounter with a shepherd since he asked me about it. And across from him, there was sitting a gentleman who seemed interested in our conversation. That was a Dr. Walter Miley. I believe I've met him the next morning. Dr. Walter Miley has been interested in near-death experiences for the last 40 years. He is working as a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist and as a trauma therapist. So as we were talking, I told him my story in a little more depth, and we were standing across from each other, and he just looked at me and he said, you have to write a book. And then all of a sudden this thought crossed my mind, I know that I have to write a book, but I don't know how, what, where. And then he added the following sentence, I will help you with it. At the time where I should start to write a book, which I've known for 20 years already, whereas this thought about the book itself wasn't present in my mind, suddenly this person is standing in front of me who is willing to help me with that. So after the conference, I had sent him my first manuscript that I had already turned from my handwritten notes from the year 2000 on into text format on my computer. Due to his expertise and professional background, he was able to insert footnotes which referred to biblical texts as well as to explanations for certain circumstances like the forgetting part of my experience. 
He explained that very well. Seines Fachwissens, was ist jetzt passiert, als ich das total vergessen hatte? Er hat es also dann auch gut erklärt. An episode that shows that there is something like divine guidance. Do you think that is valid for everyone? Ja. Ich, uh, das glaube ich unumwunden. Yes, I definitely believe that every human being is equally worthy. Everyone incarnates with the same amount of divine light and divine love into this world. Every human being is responsible for whatever he does with it. He can always decide yes or no, because he was also gifted with free will. I believe that if everyone would make himself aware of the fact that there is a spark of God's light within every one of us, that God is at home in every soul, then the situation would not arise in the first place, where a lot is being covered up by external appearances which burden the connection to oneself, to one's own innermost core, to one's soul, to God, so that the soft inner guidance, the small hints and intuition is not perceived anymore. Ms. Douster, I hope that your book is going to remove many taboos and bring about a lot of good and healing. I wish you all the best and lots of success. And thank you so much for this interview.